What you're about to hear is a debate that we did against William Goley on October 24, 2006. William Goley studies the issue of sedevacantism, and he has a degree in systematic theology from Seton Hall University in New Jersey. We would like to encourage all the people who hear this debate to get our three DVD package, which contains 10 programs, audio tapes, flyers, magazines, for only $8. And they can order that online at our website, www.mostholyfamilymonastery.com. That's M-O-N-A-S-T-E-R-Y.com. Or they can call us at 1-800-275-1126. Also, on our website, uh, we have almost all of our videos online, which people can watch for free. I will be moderating this debate. The question is, are the post-Vatican II claimants to the papacy true popes? This debate is between Mr. William Goley and Brother Michael Diamond and Brother Peter Diamond. Mr. Goley has taken the position that, yes, the post-Vatican II claimants to the papacy are true popes. Brothers Michael and Peter Diamond are taking, the position, are taking the position that, no, they are not. The format of this debate is that each side will give an opening statement, beginning with Mr. Goley. Those statements will be 20 minutes each. There will be a first rebuttal for each side, 15 minutes each. Then there will be a seven-question examination, where each side will ask the other side seven questions. There will be a three-minute response and a two-minute rebuttal to each question. Following those questions, there will be a 10-minute response or rebuttal from each side, following by 15-minute closing remarks for each side. And Mr. Goley will go first for each section. We'll begin now with Mr. Goley's opening statement. Okay. I wish to thank the brothers for allowing me the opportunity to discuss this uh very important uh, issue of of sedivacantism. And as I study uh, the different sedivacantist positions, uh, each one of them differ slightly in their arguments. So my argument tonight will be specifically against what I believe to be the erroneous position of the Diamond Brothers. Most of my arguments can be used against other sedivacantists as well, but I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, I wish to immediately address a number of the errors that I see uh, within the Diamond, uh, Diamond Brothers' argument. In studying their website, uh, their logic seems to go like this. A heretic cannot hold the papal office. And one of the things that the Diamond Brothers do is they quote, a whole host of quotes from John the 23rd, Paul the Sixth, uh, not John Paul the First, since he only reigned for 33 days, but John Paul the Second and Benedict the Sixteenth. They take these quotes and they interpret these quotes and say that these men are heretics. This particular quote is heresy. I'm sure they'll quote a number of them uh, tonight. Uh, my position is going to be that their interpretation of these quotes cannot be correct. That if their interpretation of these quotes is correct, then the church is in utter chaos. That the foundation of the church that Jesus Christ founded is essentially no more. The first question I think I have is, for the Diamond Brothers, right off the bat is, how do you know your conclusions to these quotes are correct? One only needs to look at the various other Catholic theologians on numerous Catholic websites, and they will see that the conclusions that the Diamond Brothers draw from these quotes are disputed. Now, one may ask, well, how do you know they're they're interpretations are correct. The point that I'm making is, is that if these quotes are in dispute, we have a question. Okay? Right away, one can see throughout church history that the Arians use different scripture passages. In John's Gospel, the Father is greater than I. They use that to say that Jesus Christ was not God. 
Martin Luther used various scripture passages, such as Romans 3.28. Man is justified by, works of, uh, by faith apart from works of the law. He used that to teach the erroneous doctrine that man is justified by faith alone. So right off the bat, we have a question of whether or not the Diamond Brothers' interpretation is correct. One of the things that I'm asserting here is that based on the teaching of the First Vatican Council regarding the unity of the Church and the papal succession is that the Diamond Brothers' conclusions cannot be correct. Certain problems arise if their positions are correct, that these popes or these men are heretics, and therefore the papal see has not been occupied since Pius XII, the last reigning pope that they believe is pope. Vatican I taught in session four on July 18, 1870, but that the episcopacy itself may be one and undivided, and the entire multitude of the faithful through priests closely connected with one another, might be preserved in the unity of faith and communion, placing Peter over the other apostles he established in the perpetual principle and visible foundation of both unities upon whose strength the eternal temple might be erected and the sublimity of the church might rise in. Firmness of this faith. Furthermore, the council taught if anyone says that Peter does not have perpetual successor, let him be anathema. So let's examine that quote from Vatican I. Do, am I asserting that Vatican I says that because Peter will have successors in perpetuity, that that means that there will be a pope every single solitary second until the end of time? No, I'm not saying that. That would be ludicrous. Because all of us here, all of us in the Catholic world, Seti Vacantis and non Seti Vacantis at this moment, believe that when a valid pope dies, there is a period where the sea is vacant. What I'm asserting here today is, is that even during times like the Great Western Schism, where there was disputes on, on whether or not the papal sea was for this particular pope or that particular pope, or whether it was vacant or not, there was always a way that the faithful could know when a pope was validly elected, the parameters that, were in, that are in place were valid. What do I mean by that? Well, today we have, even if you want to assert that Pius XII was the last reigning pope, we have a situation where the law of the Church established by Pius XII and popes prior to him, the College of Cardinals elects the Pope. The problem that the Diamond Brothers have, and also other Seti Vicantis, is this. There are no more cardinals appointed by Pius XII that are still alive. The oldest cardinals are, were appointed by or made cardinals by Pope Paul VI. Therefore, you have a situation where, according to church law, under Pius XII, who made revisions to the conclave, you have a situation where you have no more cardinals to vote and elect the pope. You don't have it. So how can the, the papacy have successors in perpetuity? That's the definition of the word. We call Mary a perpetual virgin because she was a virgin throughout her life. You cannot have perpetual successors if you don't have a way to elect them. Now, I can almost anticipate the Diamond Brothers arguing that some theologians' opinion is, is that the Roman clergy will elect the, the Pope, or that the bishops uh, will get together and elect the Pope. Well, that, that, that raises problems in and of itself, because where is the Roman clergy now? Not only would they have to be Seti Vicantis, they would also have to hold all the, do all the other, I believe, erroneous doctrines that the Diamond Brothers hold. They would have to believe in the strict, absolute interpretation of no salvation outside the Church, or they're not a Catholic. They couldn't, they couldn't really be clergy. They would lose their office, according to the Diamond Brothers. So how 
are we ever going to know when there is a next pope? We'll never hear the words for certain. Shy of God coming down from the sky and writing it in fire across the sky, we don't have a clear way to know when the next pope is. And to me, that's the major flaw in SETI the Concertism. And it actually it leads to almost uh, unbelievable uh, assertions that the Diamond Brothers make. I'll give you one example. They will quote one of the, post, uh, one of the post-conciliar popes as saying that Christ is united to all, to all men. The Diamond Brothers, now watch carefully during this debate. Watch what they do. They will take a quote like that. And I believe it's from John Paul II, uh, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's from one of the five popes. They will take a quote like that, and they'll say, see that? Jesus, uh, John Paul II saying that everyone's going to heaven because he, Jesus is united to all men. That's what they do. They, they draw these vast conclusions and then automatically attribute to the pope him being a heretic, and he's not the pope. And they'll do this over and over again, even though it's been shown repeatedly. I have 40 pages here from different Catholics that totally disagree with their particular interpretation of these quotes, that you can, you can interpret them different ways. And if their interpretation is correct, if their interpretation is correct, we will never know what another, when another pope is elected. We would have a situation in, in the church today that is unprecedented in, throughout church history. We've never had another period in Roman Catholicism where not only do you not have a sitting pope for almost 50 years, but you don't have a definitive way to elect another pope. And to me, that is the, one of the major, major problems and that is one of the major problems that I will uh, put forth uh, to them today, see if they can answer that. Um, uh, how much time do I have left? Hello? You have uh, roughly ten and a half minutes. Ten and a half minutes, okay. Uh, uh, one of the other things I'd like to address is uh, some of the, uh, based on this, based on their reasoning, you have situations where they come up with, uh, in my opinion, I don't mean to be insulting, crazy arguments. Uh, and I, and I, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Sister Lucia. Uh, they, I was reading their website today. Now, I guess they sort of have to do this. And, and I would ask the audience to please just, I mean, it's almost hard to argue against them because the argument is so uh, absurd that the, Sister Lucia, who obviously most of you probably know was uh, – one of the three children that Our Lady of Fatima appeared to. Uh, and after Vatican II, she totally accepted the Vatican II Church, totally accepted the Novus Ordo Mass, totally accepted the five conciliar pope, post-conciliar popes. So what do the Diamond Brothers do? They assert, so this, this, would, this would undercut their, this would most likely undercut their argument, because here you have a woman who the Blessed Mother appeared to and told, and told her she was going to go to heaven, uh, being faithful to the uh, post-conciliar church. So what did the Diamond Brothers do? They argue, and uh, very few said he was actually. Actually, the most recent debate that uh, Bob St. Genis had with John Lane, he didn't even assert this. He just said that John Lane said that we, we, don't, we don't know. That's one of those question marks. But it seems obvious to me, and this is what the Diamond Brothers assert, that Sister Lucia was somehow kidnapped and murdered, and an imposter was put into her place. And they have pictures on their website that talk that that show the different faces. And I mean, I've looked at these pictures, and I, 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 I don't know how you draw the conclusion that it's not her. I mean, is it possible that that could have happened? I, yeah, sure, absolutely. But it's 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 crazy. That would mean that that would mean that John the Twenty Third is a murderer. That he set this up. There was this great conspiracy. That the nuns that she lived with were in on this conspiracy. It's almost. It, it, I mean, if you were arguing this in a court of law, would any jury buy this? Sure of of DNA evidence. I don't know how you can make the assertion. Um, I wish to uh, also. 
I don't really know their position if they believe John the 23rd was actually elected pope and then fell into heresy. Uh, that's something that we can address because I believe that there's different opinions on whether or not the, uh, the, the, the pope uh, can actually be deposed from heresy. I believe uh, it's clear in uh, Paul IV's uh, Cumes Apostolis that the a heretic cannot be elected pope. But that does not apply to a sitting pope. Um, I think even later on in that letter he talks about if a, if a reigning pope uh, teaches the, something contrary to the faith or leads you astray, do not follow him. So if, if somebody is a pope and he teaches something uh, wrong, the, the Holy Father, Pope Paul IV, does not say he's no longer pope. He says don't follow him. Uh, so that, that is a... Another, a whole other thing, but I believe that the Diamond Brothers are going to say that these guys were never elected. Uh, so that's something that we can talk about uh, uh, also. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that uh, the First Vatican Council's teaching that, uh, therefore, if anyone says uh, that Peter does not have perpetual successors and that the Roman Pontiff is not the successor of St. Peter in the Petrine Promise, let him be anathema. That is key. If the Diamond Brothers are correct, we do not have a way of knowing who the next Pope is. You may have. And, and another question could be, listen, it's been 50 years. If you're going to assert that the, the bishops, uh, the Seti Vicantis bishops, and the Seti Vicantis Roman clergy are, can elect a valid Pope, why not get together and do it? Why not elect a valid pope? We've been with that one for 50 years. Think of the consequences of that. What happens if there's a teaching that needs to be defined or clarified? What happens if there's a moral dilemma in this year of 2006 or 2005 or all the way up back to 1958? We don't have a pope. So if the Roman clergy can, which, which is, in my opinion, they're going to have to prove that... Uh, that there is a, some provision that in the state of emergency the Roman clergy can elect the Pope. Uh, not just a theologian's opinion, a papal document, a bull, because the la remember, not only is the Pope the supreme, uh, the supreme pontiff in matters of faith and morals, but also on church discipline. And the last Pope, Pius XII, set up, uh, not only set up, but changed the papal changed the rules slightly in the papal conclave, but reiterated that's the way we elect a pope. So who is going to overturn that? Who is going to, uh, who is going to change those rules? That's a serious problem for the Diamond Brothers and the Seti Vicantis position. They do, they do not have means to elect another pope, and therefore we can't have popes in perpetuity, shy of God coming down from the sky and announcing it to the world. And is, 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 is that something that, that we would find uh, reasonable? I think not. Uh, I think that's all I have. Do I have extra time over? I, I, I don't think I have too much more to say. Okay, you have three more minutes. Would you, you don't want to use it, though? No, that's fine. I think I've covered all my points. Okay, the, um, now we'll have the opening statement, 20 minutes, from Brother Michael Diamond and Brother Peter Diamond. Okay, one thing people need to realize is that the crisis that we're dealing with today has been predicted to happen. It's predicted to take place in the approved apparition of Our Lady of La Salette, France, when she appeared on September 19, 1846. She predicted Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The church will be in eclipse. Our Lord even talks about when he returns at the end of the world in Luke 18, verse 8, will he find any faith on earth? We also have St. Paul talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that the man of sin will sit in the temple of God. Not the temple of Satan, but the temple of God. And that our Lord also says in Matthew 24, 15, that the abomination of desolation at the end of the world will be seen even in the holy place. Uh, so we have these predictions of what is going to happen at the end of the world. The man of sin, the son of perdition that St. That Paul speaks about, uh, was analyzed by St. Hilary of Portier, and, uh, and he said that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is an apostate bishop possessed by the devil who will appear to sit at the very pinnacle of the church at the end of the world. And St. Bernard 
of Clairvaux said that the only way that the Antichrist could deceive the whole world is by becoming an anti-pope, one whom the world at large will believe is a true pope, but in actual fact will not be. We also have the prediction of Satan setting up his own throne in the prayer of Leo the Thirteenth that he devised at the end of the 19th century, uh, where he said that even over St. Peter's itself, Satan will set up his own throne. We also have the third secret of Fatima that predicts this great crisis. The people who have read the real third secret of Fatima all say that it deals with a massive apostasy that will be started from the person who claims to be the head of the Catholic Church. Okay, so... We're going to specifically address some of his objections a little bit later, but we want to quickly set forth the evidence also that this is predicted in prophecy. The Freemasons, communists, and others try to infiltrate the church. That was their dream, their plan to put their own man on the chair of Peter eventually. And then we also have from the teaching of the Catholic Church that a heretic cannot be a pope. That's something that Mr. Goley is going to have to admit. He's already actually admitted it that a heretic cannot be Pope. Pope Pius XII teaches in Mystici Corpus Christi, number 23, June 29, 1943. Not every sin, however grave it must may be, is such of its own nature to sever a man from the body of the church, as does heresy, schism, or apostasy. Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical Satis Cognitum, point nine, June 29, 1896, said, The practice of the church has always been the same, as is shown by the unanimous teaching of the fathers, who are one to hold as outside Catholic communion an alien to the church, whoever would recede in the least degree from any point of doctrine proposed by her authoritative magisterium. He also teaches in point nine that if anyone holds to a single heresy, he is not a Catholic. In point 13 of Satis Cognitum, he says, You are not to be looked upon as holding the true Catholic faith if you do not teach that the faith of Rome is to be held. And we will show that these anti-popes do not believe at all that the faith of Rome has to be held. In point 15 of Satis Cognitum, his encyclical on the uh, you know, unity of the church, he says this, quote, It is absurd to imagine that he who is outside the church can command in the church. And so we have this teaching, this infallible teaching, a heretic cannot be a member of the church, a heretic cannot exercise authority in the Catholic church, because he is not a member of the Catholic Church. And so we have this also, this principle taught by St. Alphonsus, who teaches a pope cannot be a heretic. We have St. Francis de Sales teaching that a pope cannot be a heretic. We have Pope Paul IV teaching that no Catholic can accept someone who's deviated from the Catholic faith as a legitimate pope, even if all the cardinals seem to elect him. We have St. Robert Bellarmine, who's a cardinal saint doctor of the Church, teaching this, quote, This principle is most certain. The non-Christian cannot in any way be Pope, as Cayetan himself admits. The reason for this is that he cannot be head of what he is not a member. Now, he who is not a Christian is not a member of the church, and a manifest heretic is not a Christian, as is clearly taught by St. Cyprian, St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, and others. Therefore, the manifest heretic cannot be Pope. And then again, again, he teaches... A pope who is a manifest heretic automatically ceases to be pope and head of the church just as he ceases to be a member of the church. Therefore, he can be judged and punished by the church. This is the teaching of all the ancient fathers that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. These guys, these anti-popes from John the 23rd to Benedict XVI are definitely manifest public heretics. Some of these quotes we're going to quickly run through and we may explain some of the major ones a little bit later, are almost unbelievable. They're all documented. Uh, we've gone through every single La Zerita Romana that's been republished since April 4th, 1968. Brother Peter's done a detailed analysis on Bank 16th, read 24 of his books very carefully. Uh, starting just with Paul VI, Paul VI taught that false religions and religions invented by man are noble. He said that the church esteems false non-Christian religions. Paul Paul VI said that Buddhism is one of the riches of Asia. Paul VI admired Buddhism. Paul VI looked with respect on the Buddhist way of life and said that he wanted to collaborate with the Buddhist patriarch to bring about the salvation of man. Paul VI also spoke of the riches of the Islamic faith, and he said that this Islamic faith binds us to the one God. 
He also spoke of Anglican and Muslim martyrs. Paul VI promoted the heresy of religious liberty. Paul VI attempted to lift the excommunications against the schismatics. Uh, You also have Paul VI giving away the triple crown papal tiara, which represents a true pope's authority over the church. Paul VI also removed the index of forbidden books and the oath against modernism and many saints from the traditional calendar. John Paul II taught that all men are saved. John Paul II taught that all men are in a state of sanctifying grace. John Paul II taught that the Holy Ghost is responsible for non-Christian religions in his first encyclical um, that he wrote on March 4, 1979, Redemptor Hominis in point six. By the way, in that same encyclical, the word Catholic and Catholic Church do not appear one time. John Paul II entered the Buddhist temple in 1984. John Paul II held Assisi prayer meetings on October 27, 1986, and January 24, 2002. In the first meeting in 1986, he met with 150 different religious leaders from different false religions to pray with them. At this meeting, uh, an act of putting a statue of Buddha was placed on the tabernacle in the Church of St. Francis. Pope Pius XI authoritatively condemned such interreligious prayer meetings as apostasy. John Paul II in 1985 1985 prayed with the African animus. John Paul II, going back to his second Assisi prayer meeting in 2002, actually allowed different false religious leaders, including a leader of the Hindu community, to get up right in front of John Paul II, promote Hinduism for a long time. She got up and said, we're all God. I greet all of you here who are God and thank John Paul II for allowing her to speak. The voodoo high priest also got up and promoted voodooism. This was all arranged, promoted, and set up by anti-pope John Paul II. At the rabbi then got up. Different other false religious leaders got up. After this was over, the different false religious leaders went to different rooms of St. Francis's monastery where the so-called Franciscan friars removed crucifixes from the walls in order to allow these false religions to practice their false religions in these rooms. John Paul II uh, also bowed and kissed the Koran on May 14, 1999, which blasphemes the the Trinity in Article 2 of the Koran. This is an act of apostasy. John Paul II thanked those who develop Islamic culture. John Paul II on March 21, 2000, asked St. John the Baptist to protect Islam. In 2001, John Paul II went into the mosque. On April 13, 1986, John Paul II went into the Jewish synagogue in Rome and actually bowed his head as the Jews said a prayer for the coming of their Messiah, which they don't believe it's Christ, an act of apostasy. He also teaches, he says the Catholic Church teaches, John Paul II, that the old law has not ceased, that it's still valid. Pope Benedict XIV said, a true pope, that everybody knows that the old law was revoked by the coming of Christ. On CNN's Larry King Live, Gilbert Levine, a friend of John Paul II, who's a Jew, admitted that John Paul II gave him a menorah and sent letters of congratulations to his children when they had their bar mitzvahs and actually sent a letter to Gilbert Levine and his sons to encouraging them to practice Judaism to the full. Outright total apostasy. John Paul II taught repeatedly that heretics and schismatics should not be converted, that we should not proselytize, that we should not try to convert them. John Paul II called the schismatic church the bride of Christ. John Paul II called the schismatic Orthodox church holy. John Paul II gave relics and donations to schismatic churches, including a $100,000 donation to one schismatic church. John Paul II repeatedly declared that he is in communion with non-Catholic sects. John Paul II went to the Anglican Church and took part in their false worship. John Paul II has praised the greatest enemies that the church has ever known, including Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and Huss. So when people say, you're acting like a Protestant, you can say, your, quote, Pope constantly praises Protestants, including the greatest heretic Protestants of all time. John Paul II approved of the heretical joint declaration with the Lutherans. John Paul II repeatedly taught that non-Catholics may receive communion in his catechism, the New Code of Canon Law, and his encyclical Udinum Sin of 1995. John Paul II taught that non-Catholic sects have saints and martyrs. Pope Pius XI taught that the Catholic Church alone produces saints. John Paul II approved the practice of altar girls, which was condemned by three popes. 
John Paul II said in the summer of 1999 that heaven, hell, and purgatory are not actual places. Uh, John Paul II also changed the rosary, which was given directly from heaven, by heaven. The way it was, he decided to throw in two, five new mysteries. John Paul II actually taught that man was Christ, as we prove on our website, that man is the Christ, the son of living God of Matthew 16:16. 16, 16. He taught that man is the Christ child born on Christmas. The epiphany is the manifestation of man. Man is the way, the truth, and the life. Each man is the Eucharist. Each man is the crucified Christ. Man is the Messiah. Man is the risen Christ. Um, Benedict XVI, for example, was known as a radical revolutionary theologian at Vatican II, in which at Vatican II he showed up in suit and tie. In 2001, Benedict XVI wrote the preface for the book, The Jewish People and Their Sacred Scriptures in the Christian Bible, which teaches that the Jews wait for the Messiah is not in vain, and that their position that Jesus is not the Messiah and Son of God is valid. In the book God in the World and Milestones, Benedict XVI says that the Jewish reading of the Old Testament which doesn't see Jesus as the Messiah, is acceptable and might even be true. He thus denies that Jesus is truly the Son of God. On August 19, 2005, he went into the synagogue in Cologne, Germany, and took active part in Jewish worship. This is a public act of apostasy. He recited the Kaddish prayer with the chief rabbi there and was applauded by the entire synagogue congregation for acceptance of their religion. Benedict XVI met with the chief rabbi of Rome, the new one, and blessed him and encouraged him in his, quote, mission as chief rabbi, apostasy. Uh, Benedict XVI has said that he has come to love the Orthodox Church. He's come to love the Schismatic Church. Think about that. Benedict XVI gave communion to the Protestant founder of Taizé, Brother Roger, which is heresy, and said he went straight to heaven when he died. Benedict XVI approves attendance at masses which have no words of consecration, heresy. Benedict XVI denies that words are even necessary for a valid consecration, heresy. Benedict XVI uh, kisses the Koran actually in words in a way when he just recently said that he respects the Koran as a holy book of a great religion. Benedict XVI says that pagan and idolatrous, idolatrous religions are high and pure. Benedict XVI has a profound respect for false faith, faiths. Benedict XVI says that there are pagan saints. Benedict XVI says there are many ways to heaven besides the Christian faith. Benedict XVI teaches that the orig term original sin is false. Benedict XVI teaches that the church exists outside the church. Benedict XVI rejects the unity or oneness of the Catholic Church. Benedict XVI respects Hans Kung's path of denial of Jesus Christ. Benedict XVI denies the resurrection of the body. If this is a manifest public heresy, anyone who would deny it is just of bad will. The evidence is so clear-cut. And we could supplement that by looking at the official teaching of the Vatican II Church uh, from the documents of Vatican II, which lay the foundation for all the manifest heresy he just covered. Uh, in its decree on ecumenism, uh, Vatican II longs for the universal church as if the universal church has not yet been established. And John Paul II, commenting on this passage in Vatican II, said that we, Catholics and Protestants, both long for the universal church, which therefore does not yet exist. Uh, Vatican II says that the Catholic church is not fully Catholic in its decree on ecumenism. It teaches that heretics and schismatics are brought into a partial communion with the church, when he already quoted Pope Leo XIII, who taught that the church has always held that heretics are alien to the church completely outside of her communion. Vatican II says that the life of grace exists outside the church, which is a denial of Pope Boniface VIII, that outside the church there is no salvation nor remission of sins. Vatican II says that non-Catholic sects are a means of salvation. It says that their liturgical uh, actions give them access to the communion of salvation. Non-Catholic sects, Protestant sects, are outside the Catholic church. It's a dogma that there is no salvation outside the church. This is clear heresy, Bold denial of the dogma outside the church, there's no salvation. Uh, Vatican II teaches, officially in Orientalium Ecclesiarum number 27, that non-Catholics may lawfully receive Holy Communion, okay, which has been condemned throughout the whole history of the church, and three different popes can be cited saying that he who eats the lamb outside the church is profane. Vatican II teaches that Catholic churches should be shared with non-Catholics, Vatican II teaches that Muslims and Catholics together worship the one true God 
who will judge mankind on the last day. Muslims reject the Trinity. They reject Jesus Christ. They worship the true God together with Catholics who will judge mankind on the last day. This is bold heresy. Vatican II teaches that the church is united with those who don't accept the faith or the papacy. That's exactly the opposite of Catholic teaching. The papacy is the principle of unity in the church. Those who don't accept the papacy are outside the church. Vatican II is saying that the church is joined to those who don't accept the papacy. Vatican II teaches that the church is insufficient as a means of salvation. Vatican II teaches that in Buddhism, a way is taught by which man can reach the highest illumination. A way is taught. That's what it says. Vatican II teaches, uh, it praises man, says man is superior to everything, and everything on earth should be directed toward man as its center and crown. Vatican II called for the changing of the right of every single sacrament. It called for bodily self-expression in the liturgy. It called for the customs and music of pagan peoples in the liturgy, which was explicitly condemned by Pope St. Pius X as modernism. Uh, all of this serves to show the revolutionary intention and program of Vatican II. And the most irrefutable, undeniable heresy in Vatican II comes in Nostra Aetate No. 4, where it said that although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected by God. Okay, and the Latin word there it uses is reprobati, which comes from the verb reprobo. Okay, so what the church, what Vatican II is saying is that the Jews should not be looked upon as having been rejected. Well, the Council of Florence, you can find this in Denzinger 705 in the Latin, uh, declared infallibly that the church, and I want to read this, condemns, rejects, anathematizes, and declares to be outside the body of Christ, which is the church, whoever holds opposing or contrary views. And the word it uses there is reprobat, the same, from the same verb, reprobo. So the Council of Florence rejects all who have a different opinion on Jesus Christ, namely the Jews. The church rejects them. That's infallible dogma. Vatican II, using the same verb, says that the Jews are not to be looked upon as having been rejected. It doesn't get any more specific than that. That's formal heresy, and this heresy, bold heresy, is, of course, why we see John Paul II going into the synagogue, why we see Benedict XVI going in taking active part in the synagogue, why we see this all over the Novus Ordo sect with their bishops praising Judaism, interreligious prayer meetings with Judaism. Okay, it's all laid down in the official teaching of Vatican II, which Paul VI solemnly confirmed. If Paul VI is a true pope, Vatican II is the magisterial teaching of the Catholic Church. As he said very clearly, that's impossible. That's absolutely impossible. Because the magisterial teaching of the Church teaches the opposite. And he, thus what we've proven so far is that they cannot be popes because they're manifest heretics. And that the official teaching of this sect is diametrically opposed to the official teaching of the true popes throughout history. How, how much time do we have there? You've got about 30 seconds. Okay, maybe we'll just stop there. Okay, the next round of debate is the first rebuttal. It will be 15 minutes for each side, beginning with Mr. Goley. Yeah, the Diamond Brothers have done exactly what I knew they would do. Uh, they've cited, obviously they've had 50 years, roughly 50 years of, uh, of, of five popes, and it's obvious that they can quote a lot of passages. But I obviously I cannot address in 15 minutes each and every single solitary passage. That would be that would be uh, crazy. But I think if you go back and you look at each single thing they quoted, you can explain each quote. It's been done. Like I said, I have 40 pages here from different websites that have taken on the Diamond Brothers, point by point, on these quotes that they're giving you. Uh, again, they're interpreting these documents to mean that these uh, individuals are heretics. Uh, I'm saying that it's impossible for their position to be correct. If their position is correct, we have no more hierarchy in the church. 
you're left with one conclusion. Either the Diamond Brothers' interpretation of all these papal quotes over almost 50 years are correct, or other Catholic theologians that have talked about this and have said, no, the popes don't mean, don't mean this in a heretical way. I mean, I could go, I mean, in 1981, John Paul II reaffirmed in a, in a, in a speech in France, no salvation outside the church. He said it's a truth that we must, that the church must uphold. Uh, Cardinal, Cardinal uh, Ratzinger, when he was uh, uh, not the Pope, when John Paul II was the Pope, reaffirmed no salvation outside the Church. And Domini Jesus may not interpret it in the Fenite sense the way the Diamond Brothers do, which I believe is wrong, but that's a whole other issue. Okay? And to say that the, these Popes don't believe in the resurrection or believe that all men are God, I mean, it's, it's, it's not correct. It is incorrect. You have you have quote after quote from these guys that would say the opposite of what the Diamond Brothers are saying. And to say that, now, am I advocating necessarily everything that these, these uh, popes have done? No, I'm not. I don't want to get into the criticism of them, but I do not. But that's not heresy. That's not apostasy. They're taking one quote and stretching it. Go back, look at the quotes, do them one by one. It's impossible to do that here in 15 minutes. As far as the private revelation goes, the church has never held that every single solitary thing in a private revelation that has been reported, even if it is approved, is necessarily factual. Uh, and also, you can interpret some of those private revelations as, as being absolutely correct, even with even in the post-conciliar church. The church definitely is in crisis. Def there definitely has been a great falling away. There definitely are priests and bishops that do not follow the Catholic faith. But that doesn't mean the, conclu that doesn't mean the conclusions that the Diamond Brothers are bringing forth. They need to deal with directly Vatican I's teaching that the papacy will be there till the end of time, in perpetuity. If they can't deal with that, their interpretations cannot be correct. I don't have to go down and refute everything that they said, okay? It would be impossible. They have 50 years to quote documents. And incidentally, believe me, do a Google search. Do a Google search on Benedict the Sixteenth, John the Twenty-Third, John Paul the Second. You'll see they said no salvation outside the church. Uh, you'll see that they believed in the resurrection. You'll see that they didn't believe that, that every man is God. That's ludicrous. They're taking those quotes out of context, just like the Arians did in John 14, the Father is greater than I, just like Martin Luther did in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, when he said that man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. How do we know that? Because if Luther was correct, then we know that the teaching of the church, that, that, that Christ promised, went down the tubes. Same with the diamonds. We know they're not correct, because if it's true what they say, then Vatican I is wrong, that we have no hierarchy, we have no legitimate bishops with jurisdiction, since we haven't had a pope in 50 years, they get the jurisdiction from the Holy Father. We don't have a college of cardinals, because Pius XII, the last pope, there are no more cardinals alive that he appointed or made cardinal. So we know their interpretation of these documents cannot be correct. Then we have the whole situation with Sister Lucia, where they have to stretch that. That's another stretch, just like their documents here. It's, it's insane to draw some of the conclusions that these two men are drawing. Anyone can sit there and quote, quote passages and draw conclusions from those passages and say this person's a manifest heretic. And I may never, I may not be able to explain every single one. I, I believe I can explain a good, darn good many that they're not heresy. But I don't necessarily have to in a sense because if their conclusions are correct, I, then we don't have a church. So I know their conclusions cannot be correct. And that's the point they're going to have to deal with today. I'm not going to let them off the hook. 
I'm going to pound home the fact that in their church, the church that they purport, they're going to have to account for how the next pope's elected, how the faithful's going to know he's elected, who is going to elect him, and why if it's why hasn't it been done? Why hasn't it been done? If Peter has successors in perpetuity for 47 years, we haven't had a pope. We're going on half a century. That's unprecedented in church history. Number one, I don't believe we've gone this long without a Holy Father. Okay? And number two, we've never had a situation where the church has set up the rules to elect another pope, and then all those rules can't happen anymore because everyone's dead. It hasn't happened. And they're going to have to deal with that. So who's correct? If the Diamond Brothers are correct, if their conclusions are right with all these quotes that they're saying, that say these guys are heretics, then the church really has ceased to exist because there is no hierarchy, there is no bishop with jurisdiction, there is no college of cardinals to elect a, a, a pope. So we got a major problem here, and the Diamonds need to explain that. Is it possible they could be wrong about their interpretations of these popes? Absolutely it is. Was Luther wrong? Was Calvin wrong when he used Romans chapter 9 to assert double predestination? Did they think they were right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Were the Arians wrong? Yes. And they quoted passages such as this. Uh, I believe that... Uh, let's see. Uh, again, the scriptural verse is about the... The, uh, the Antichrist being in Rome, I mean, that certainly could be true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to occupy the papacy. I mean, I'm sure we can get in the whole exegetical argument from these, from these, from these passages, but again, uh, I, I, I do not believe in any way whatsoever that you can uh, qu quote a hundred things from, from 50 years, draw the conclusion that these guys are heretics, when you have to admit, you have to admit that if you put as much effort into finding the heresy, that you could also find just as many orthodox statements. And again, here we have two individuals and other individuals that represent probably less than 1% of the Catholic population, 0.006%, and they're interpreting these documents on their own, and they're deposing the Pope. Really, the burden of proof is on them to show where, where the Church has taught that a private individual can depose a Pope. It, it's unprecedented. And they really need to, hopefully in this next section, address the fact that they don't have a way of electing another Pope. They don't have a bishop with jurisdiction. They don't have a hierarchy because everyone has died off. Uh, they would have a better claim if this was 1960, okay? They would have a better claim that this is 1960 when there were still valid cardinals, or maybe even 1970. But you don't have that. You don't have any. And that's what they need to address. They can quote all the quotes they want from all the different books and different letters and, and encyclicals and, and, and papal speeches, and, and they're going to draw those conclusions that the Pope is a heretic based on that. But I don't believe it cuts the mustard, because, again, if what they're saying is true, if their conclusions are correct, and many disagree, including myself, and there's been many things written. I mean, I just read a thing on uh, Father, uh, Father William Most. If, if somebody does a Google search on that, goes uh, down and, and, and explains how Vatican II's uh, decree on religious liberty can be reconciled with tradition. The Diamond Brothers don't believe that. I understand that. But my point is, is that... It can be disputed, and if you look at tradition and you look at the church, for the Diamond Brothers' position to be correct, number one, we have an unprecedented, it's never happened in the Catholic Church that we've, had a, we've been without a pope for this long, and number two, it's never happened where we don't have a way to get another head. There's no, there's no distinctive way for us to know. So how can the Diamond Brothers be correct? Just think about it. Think about it. Can their interpretation of these documents be correct? Or is it, since this has never happened, 
could the Diamond Brothers in Fillmore, New York, be wrong? And could these guys, hey, maybe they're not the best popes. Maybe they're, maybe they're, they're weak in some areas. Maybe they don't always do the right thing. I don't think any traditional Catholic is going to say that they do. But nonetheless, they're still valid popes, because if they're not, we don't have a Catholic church. We simply don't, and that's what needs to be addressed for anyone to convince myself and a lot of other people that the Seti Vicantis position is correct. Not only, how much time do I have? About three minutes. Three minutes. Not only, see, here's the dilemma that the Diamond Brothers also have as far as electing another pope. Not only are they going to have to find a, uh, a, a validly appointed cardinal, but they're going to have to find a cardinal that agrees with them. Because their position is, is that if you don't hold the Seti Vacantis position, or if you don't hold the, uh, the Feniite position on no salvation outside the church, that water baptism is absolutely necessary, then you're not a Catholic. Then you would lose your office. Same with the same with the Roman clergy that they they say that that Teddy Vicantis sometimes say uh, Alexa Alexa the Pope because that's the it's the Roman See. Again, not church teaching, but it is an opinion of some theologians. But again, how would the faithful know? And not only would they have to be a, a validly ordained or a validly appointed uh, clergyman, but also have to hold everything that the Diamond Brothers hold in order for them to say that this person is Catholic. If they can't do that, they can quote things all up in the air all day they want and try to stretch the interpretation out, but it's not going to work unless they can prove that there's a way to elect another pope. And if they can't do that, then, then and, and they still hold that conclusion, then Vatican I that says Peter has successors in perpetuity is wrong, because how can you have perpetual successors when you have no way to know if somebody is elected? It's simply impossible. And they want to quote 500 passages. I mean, uh, it, it's almost not fair. It's almost not fair. I mean, if we want to do subsequent debates on this very issue, we could take five passages of their choosing, and I'll come back, and I'll debate each passage. I mean, we could do that. But, to, you know, to quote 500 passages of, of the 50 years of these popes, I think, uh, uh, you know, obviously it can't, can't be all addressed. Uh, I think I'll yield right now. Bye. All right, the next section is a 15-minute rebuttal by Brother Michael and Brother Peter Diamond. Okay, I wanted to start out by addressing his accusation that these are misinterpretations. And if that were true, then he should yield to the interpretation given to him by his ecclesiastical authorities. So I'm going to quote Cardinal Walter Casper who was appointed as prefect of the Congregation on Christian Unity by John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Here's what he says about this. Today we no longer understand ecumenism in the sense of a return by which the others would be converted and return to being Catholics. This was expressly abandoned by Vatican II. So while he's saying that our interpretation is, is false, we've got his own ecclesiastical authority admitting that it's true. He's admitting that Vatican II abandoned the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church expressed by Pope Pius XI in Mortalium Animus, where he said that the union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true Church of Christ of those who are separated from it. And Benedict XVI repeats this word for word almost on August 19, 2005, and I'll read the whole passage so you can't make any accusations of uh, context. And now we must ask, what does it mean to restore the unity of all Christians? This unity does not mean what could be called ecumenism of the return. That is, to deny and to reject one's own faith history? Absolutely not. This is an address to Protestants. So he's saying the exact same thing as Casper. They reject the ecumenism of the return. So we've got the very authorities of the Vatican II Church admitting exactly what we're saying to illustrate how, frankly, absurd what he's saying is and we can see this in practice by them turning away people actually going to the vatican saying i want to convert schismatic orthodox priests and they say no no you no longer have to convert now this furthermore there's some confusion in, in mr goli that between the proximate rule of faith and the remote rule of faith scripture and tradition are are remote rules of faith okay that's why we're not proving our point by quoting singular bible passages we're quoting proving our point by quoting the magisterial teaching of the popes that's the proximate rule of faith. 
the magisterial teaching of the popes tells us the meaning of scripture and tradition. Okay, and from that, there, there is no further interpretation. Okay, so once you quote a dogma, that's the end. You, if, if that doesn't settle the matter, then you could never settle the matter. And that's why, for instance, if we were to apply his logic, he would have to accept as the authentic interpretation of the Council of Trent the Vatican's 1999 joint declaration with the Lutherans on the doctrine of justification, which we'll talk a little bit about, in which the Vatican, John Paul II and Benedict XVI approved of it, agreed that the canons of the Council of Trent condemning Lutheran teaching no longer apply. Okay, Now let's talk a little bit about Vatican I, because actually Vatican I is one of the biggest proofs that Benedict XVI is not the Pope. He, he explicitly denies uh, the whole force of Vatican I. In his book, Principles of Catholic Theology, Benedict XVI cites, uh, makes reference to the necessity of, of non-Catholics to accept Vatican Council I, and he says that, and I'm finding the quote here, Uh, before I get to that, actually, I'll, I'll go back to addressing his, his quotes. He says that, he quotes Vatican I, which says that it places Peter over the other apostles. He established in him the perpetual principle and visible foundation of both unities, of faith and communion. So Peter is the perpetual principle and visible foundation of the unity of faith and communion. Well, that remains true even when there's no pope, okay? Because even today, when we don't have a pope, we can distinguish who are the members of the church, by those who accept all the teachings of the popes from those who do not. That's why we can say that the Orthodox are not in communion with the church and they don't have the faith of the church because they reject Peter as the perpetual principle of unity. Okay, so that remains true even when there is no pope. And actually this passage that he cited, Peter is the perpetual principle and visible foundation of unity of faith and communion, is directly rejected by Vatican II we're in Lumen Gentium 15, which says that the church recognizes that it is joined to those who, though baptized and so honored with the Christian name, do not profess the faith in its entirety or do not preserve communion under the successor of St. Peter. So Vatican I is saying that St. Peter and his successors are the principle of, of, of unity of faith and communion. Vatican II is saying that the church is joined to those who reject the communion of St. Peter, directly denying this passage. Now, I have this quote from Benedict XVI, directly making reference to Vatican I, okay? On the part of the West, the maximum demand would be that the East recognize the primacy of the Bishop of Rome in the full scope of the definition of 1870. As regards Protestantism, the maximum demand of the Catholic Church would be that the Protestant ecclesiological ministers be regarded as totally invalid and that the Protestants be converted to Catholicism. He says those would be the maximum demands. He says none of the maximum solutions offers any real hope of unity. So he explicitly makes reference to the full scope, quote, of the definition of 1870 and says it, them accepting that is not the way for unity. So he's defending a man as the Pope who says you don't even have to accept the Pope or the definitions of Vatican I. It's just insanity. And Vatican I also says if you don't accept these, the primacy of the Pope, you cannot be considered as part of the Catholic Church. That's right. It's, and furthermore, he admitted that there are gaps between the papacy between the succession of one pope to the other. Okay, the church has never said that you, the gap can only last a certain period of time. That's why his argument proves nothing. And there's a principle established in theology that if you have a time without a pope, a day, a week, a year, three and a half years we've had without a pope, you could be without a pope for 50 or 60 years. There's absolutely nothing that Mr. Goli can cite that by any authority of the church that says that a crisis that we're dealing with today cannot happen. What we're saying is the reality of the situation. He has nothing and, to and, prove. And just so people understand quickly what Vatican I is saying by perpetual successors in the primacy, that the Eastern schismatics hold, so many of them, that the Bishop of Rome is the successor of St. Peter. That's what they hold. But they deny that the Bishop of Rome has the supreme primacy of jurisdiction that St. Peter had. So they hold that the primacy of supreme jurisdiction stopped with St. Peter. It did not continue down to the following bishops of Rome throughout the ages. Okay, and so Vatican I is condemning that by saying that Peter and his successors are perpetually the successors in the same primacy, which means that whenever you have a true pope, he holds the exact same primacy in the church that the first pope held. Okay, the primacy is perpetual whenever you have a true pope. 
And of course, it does not mean you always have to have a true pope. That's why Father Edmund James O'Reilly, writing after Vatican I, a well-known Irish theologian, said that the papacy could be without a pope for almost four decades. And he says, we cannot dismiss as impossible that which uh, we would regard as distressing. He had even said that what happened during the Great Western Schism, that a lot of people would say that this is impossible. In fact, there are people at the Great Western Schism living during that time when there are two popes and then a third pope that absolutely thought there was no way that this situation could be, could be resolved. And so, and you also, he mentions about how you're going to get the cardinals. Well, the cardinals have not always elected the pope. For the first millennium, you had the clergy electing the pope. So cardinals have not always elected a pope. He mentions that anyone who doesn't agree with us is not a Catholic. We've never said that. And he also brings up Sister Lucia uh, as one of his main arguments. When we show the photographic evidence on our website, and it's on others, they've done even more detailed analysis, of the evidence that these were two different people, uh, so that doesn't prove his point either. And also, if you accept that she was the real Sister Lucia, you have to accept that the Vatican version of the Third Secret is authentic, since she confirmed that. You have to accept that it refers to the assassination attempt of John Paul II, because she confirmed that. That is utterly ridiculous. And we know for a fact that the real Sister Lucia said that the Third Secret of Fatima would make more sense in 1960. This other one, which was interviewed, and I know someone who was involved with the interview in 1992, in which she was asked about, didn't Our Lady say it was to be revealed in 1960 because it will make more sense then? And she responded, Our Lady never said that. She also said that Our Lady never intended the third secret to be revealed. It was only intended for the Pope. And that's why Mr. Goli contradicts himself when he says that he first said that it's crazy, and then he admitted it was possible that there's a false sister Lucia. So if it's possible, then you know there's no argument there. Um, he, he, he criticized the quote that John Paul II says that Christ is united with each man. Well, that's actually uh, not the primary quote we, we bring forward to prove that he preached universal salvation. It's actually slightly different where he, he explains that. In Redemptor Homage number 13, he says, Christ has united himself with each man forever, okay, so that the union never ceases. He says the same thing in Redemptoris Missio number 4. And with each one, Christ has united himself forever through this mystery. He says the same thing in Santissimus Annus number 53. Christ has united himself with each one forever. And we have... Uh, other explicit quotes where general audience, December 27, 1978, John Paul II, the whole of humanity is redeemed, saved, ennobled to the extent of participating in divine life by means of grace. The phrase divine life is the scriptural term for justification, the state of grace. And therefore that means that all men are saved because hell by definition is separation from God. So if all men are united to Christ forever, that means that all men are saved. And he goes on and says that all men are united to Christ from the moment of their conception. And so he's actually preaching that all men are, are the immaculate conception. That, that's right. So, that it, you know, so we have uh, numerous examples of, of this. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the objections. And all you need to do to, to see that this is what's going on are, is to look at the actions. See, heresy is not only manifested by word, but also by deed. Okay, St. Thomas Aquinas said that if anyone were to worship at the tomb of Muhammad, he would be deemed an apostate by that action. Okay, that's why Pope Pius IX, in his uh, dogmatic definition of the Immaculate Conception, explain that heresy against that dogma could be signified by word, by writing, or by other external means. Okay, so when John Paul II prays with the Anglicans, when he prays with the Lutherans, when he goes into their churches, when he says he's in communion with them, this is all manifestation of heresy by deed. Okay, and so when you see him praying with the witch doctors, when you see him uh, t expressing his anxiousness to meet the Supreme Buddhist Patriarch in the temple and calling the Supreme Buddhist Patriarch His Holiness, okay, you're, you're witnessing apostasy by deed. So you can see that by the pictures. And Benedict XVI actually doesn't even believe that Protestantism, he says Protestantism is not heresy. And I'd like Mr. Goley, if he wants to challenge us on that, we'll show right from Ratzinger's writings where he says that Protestant, Protestantism is not heresy. And that, of course flows directly from the heretical teachings of Vatican II, where it says that those in these non-Catholic religious communities cannot be accused of the sin of separation, which is heresy or schism. And it says that generally, without making any qualification. So Protestants are not heretics, according to 
the Vatican II religion. And also, he may bring up, well, you're saying the gates of hell have prevailed against the church. Actually, the popes have defined what the gates of hell, mentioned Matthew 16, are. And they've defined the gates of hell as being heretics. So when Mr. Gulley asserts, this is the leadership of the Catholic Church, okay, he's asserting that the gates of hell have prevailed against the church. Not what we're saying, what he's saying. Because he's asserting that these heretics, these apostates, are the legitimate authority in the Catholic Church. He made reference to Dominus Jesus. Well, Dominus Jesus refer, reaffirms the heresy of Vatican II, which teaches that Protestant religions are a means of salvation. It says that schismatic sects are true particular churches, which means true dioceses in the one true church. Benedict XVI, in a series of addresses, they're quoted on our, in a quote on our website, you can see it. He said that after Dominus Jesus, the Church of Christ is present and operative in these sects. Okay, so Dominus Jesus teaches heresy. It also expresses the idea that these other religions might have some positive uh, will, might be positively willed by God in the means of salvation. In other words, God might will false religions. Um, you know, and also, see, what people need to realize is that those who are divided in faith or in government cannot be living in the unity of the same church. That's what Pope Pius XII teaches in Mystici Corpus Christi. So someone who would say, well, my faith isn't the same as uh, Benedict XVI, you know, because I disagree with this, that, and the other thing. Well, you're not in the same church. And uh, God commands us, okay, in Titus, to avoid a heretic. Okay, he would not command us to avoid a heretic, as St. Robert Bellarmine pointed out, if we could not know that someone is a heretic. And that's why he says, for men are not bound or able to read hearts. But when they see that someone is a heretic by his external works, they judge him to be heretic, pure and simple, and condemn him as a heretic. And he mentioned how few people believe uh, this. Well, in, during the Arian crisis, 97% of the bishops became Arian. And if that's just a prelude to the great apostasy, what will it be like in the great apostasy? And also, we mentioned our Lord says in Luke 18.8, 18, 18, will there be any faith when he returns? He men mentions it will be as in the days of Noah, eight people out of the entire world spared. Okay, so you have this thing, false signs and wonders to deceive the elect if that were possible. If he didn't shorten in those days, no human flesh would be saved. So you have a clear picture of a total apostasy. It's been predicted. Mr. Goley seems to be denying almost that there will be a great apostasy at the end of the world. That's everyone just about admits that that will happen. And it, it'll be worse than the Great Western Schism when you had three claimants of the papacy. You had anti-popes in Rome. You had the whole College of Cardinals following anti-pope Clement VII. The majority of people were supporting the false pope. Oh, yeah. The le true pope was the least supported of the three. You had – people had no idea, says Warren Carroll. He says, no way out of this seemed possible. That's what he said about the Great Western Schism. And also – Okay. Time has expired. Okay, okay. That's 15 minutes. So now we'll move on to the question and answer section. Uh, seven questions from each side with a three-minute response and a two-minute rebuttal. The first question from Mr. Goley. Uh, I ask the first question? Yes. Okay. Uh, since you guys didn't address it in my last point, um, I would like you guys to address the quote from Vatican I that uh, St. Peter uh, has successors in perpetuity, and if that is the case, how will you know when the next pope will be elected? How will the faithful know? Okay, I would answer that by pointing out that I just did discuss what the meaning of Vatican I's definition on the perpetuity of the primacy and the successors in the primacy mean. So I'm not going to go over that ground again. I would point out that in the first millennium, the pope was, as he pointed out, elected by the clergy of Rome, okay? And exactly how that occurred was not always clear at times. For instance, in the 7th century, during the Monothelite crisis, Pope St. Martin I was the true pope, and he was imprisoned okay, by the Monothelite emperor. And the faithful, not having access to their true pope, actually went ahead and elected Pope Eugene as their pope. But the election was actually invalid because Pope Martin I was still living. Okay, But at some point, it's still not even clear today when, Pope St. Martin I either resigned, okay, or after his death, Pope Eugene IV somehow became the pope because he's listed as the true pope in the line of popes. But his election had already occurred when Pope St. Martin I was living. Therefore, that election was not valid. But at some point, by his acceptance by the clergy of Rome, which is still not even clear when or exactly by what particular specific mechanism, he was considered the true pope. Okay, that proves that 
a recognition by the clergy of Rome, which may not be known to have specific parameters, okay, even to this day about past elections, is certainly possible and has historical precedent for it. And that would be my answer to that question. Two-minute rebuttal, Mr. Goley. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe he's answered the question. Uh, uh, he, you know, he cites a specific time in history where the Roman clergy recognized the Pope, and I understand that. But that was, at the time, the tradition or the rule of the Church. We have, a, from, I believe, uh, at least the 13th century, and right all the way up until their own last Pope, we have Pius XII making a definitive rule in the Church that has the College of Cardinals elect the Pope. So it would take a, the Pope's authority to change that law, because Vatican I said that the Pope has uh, supreme power in disciplinary matters as well. So you have, again, a time unprecedented in history where these two gentlemen, they can't even tell you how or when we're going to have a next pope. They don't know. So their position can't be correct. They can quote everything they want, I assure you. Their interpretations are not correct. They can't tell us when there will be a next pope. Their, 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 their position is unprecedented in history, where not only do we not have a pope for 50 years, we don't have the electorate also. The electorate is gone. And that is the rule of the Church by their own last pope, Pius XII. He reaffirmed the conclave, changed some of the rules. That's still in effect. It would take another pope to overturn that. But the problem is they don't have one, they don't know how to get one, and they, they can't even tell us how we're going to know when the next pope is elected. So I guess the faithful just, they won't know. It, it, it's absurd. It's really absurd, and they haven't addressed it. I'm going to hold them to it. I, 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 expect, I expect in the future that they will have a better argument than that. Their argument is we, we, we simply don't know. Okay, and time is up. Okay. Uh, first question from Brother Michael and Brother Peter Diamond. Okay, my question is this. Could you please explain to us why, as you say, the ecumenical gestures made by the Vatican II anti-popes toward the schismatics, such as praising their churches, giving them relics, declaring communion with them, praying with them, signing joint declarations with them on matters of faith, giving them donations, praising their mission, etc., do not signify, indeed, the heresy that the schismatics are not bound to accept the primacy of the popes, as defined by Vatican I. Well, again, again, we go back to the same thing that you guys have quoted throughout the, throughout the debate. And, uh, again, some of these actions... I don't believe that if you said to Pope Benedict XVI or John Paul II that I don't think they would say, uh, what we mean by this is, hey, these guys are going to go to heaven. They don't need to come over and convert to the Catholic Church. Uh, there's a whole lot of prudential decisions that these uh, four or five popes have made that I may disagree with. But to take one quote or to take one action and say, Oh, he gave them a relic, or he gave them a dollar amount of money. He's a heretic. He's denying the faith. I don't think you can make that conclusion. I simply don't think you can. And based upon the fact that if your conclusion is correct, we have no bishops, we have no cardinals, we have no hierarchy. One of the reasons whenever I debate a Protestant, I always bring up the fact that for 1,500 years, nobody believed in sola scriptura. Nobody believed in justification by faith alone. So your interpretation of Scripture, Mr. Parson, can't be correct, because if that was true, the gates of hell prevailed against the church, and there, is no, there, is, there was no Christian church for 15 years. So you're going to have to argue like a Mormon argues. Well, I assert the same thing to you guys. I'm not going to sit there and, and, and let's explain 500 different quotes and try to find, you know, figure out a way, hey, what, what did he mean by this when he gave this relic to the Orthodox Church? But I'm asserting that your conclusion can't be correct, because you can't even tell us uh, how we're going to get another pope. You can't tell us, you can't cite an uh, incident in history where not only did it was the see vacant, but the electors were, were, were vacant, and that directly contradicts the present law of the pope you believe is current, Pius XII, the last pope. So 
I'm asserting that your interpretations can't be correct, just like the Protestants' interpretations of Scripture can't be correct, because the fathers of the Church interpreted them Catholic, or, and there was no small amount for, for justification by faith alone in sola scriptura. Nobody believed what they did. On the Eucharist, nobody believed what they did for a thousand years. I try not to nitpick with the Protestants on, on these issues, and, and I'm, my, my, because their conclusions can't be correct, just like your conclusion can't be correct. Because if your conclusion is correct, we have no hierarchy, we have no pope, we have no way of getting another pope. So your interpretation and your conclusions on these questions cannot be correct. Cannot. Okay, and the rebuttal? I asked him if the gestures, the ecumenical gestures, signify a denial of the papal primacy, a denial of the necessity for the schismatics to accept the papal primacy. He said, no, you can't make that statement. Well, let's quote Benedict XVI, who explains exactly what these gestures mean. Immediately after denying that the Protestants and the schismatics are bound to accept papal primacy on pages 197 and 198 of his book, Principles of Catholic Theology, he, he makes reference to these gestures. He says, nor is it possible, on the other hand, for one re to regard as the only possible form, and consequently as binding on all Christians, the form this primacy, meaning the primacy of Peter, has taken in the 19th and 20th century. So he's saying that the primacy of Peter cannot be binding on all Christians. Okay, Protestant schismatics. He goes, the symbolic gestures of Pope Paul VI and, in particular, his kneeling before the representative of the ecumenical patriarch, Athenagoras, referring to the schismatic patriarch, were an attempt to express precisely this. Okay, so we have his, quote, Pope admitting that these gestures, such as Paul VI's gesture to kneel before the representative of the schismatic patriarch, expressly signifies that they are not bound to accept Vatican I. How, how much time do I have? About 40 seconds. He mentioned that it's within the discipline of the church. Well, not all papal elections worked that way. For instance, coming out of the Great Western Schism, at the Council of Constance, which resolved it, you had voting done by nations, okay? When voting was done by uh, ca cardinals in the conclave. You had other conclaves which were strictly bound not to have uh, any communication with emperors at the time. But they actually violated that, but the election was still considered valid. It wasn't strictly within the parameters of church discipline. Furthermore, it's an ecclesiastical law, okay, which was not the practice Time. in the early church. The second question now from Mr. Goley. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, looking at uh, Luther, uh, looking at Luther, if, if, if you were alive back in the 16th century and... Martin Luther quoted to you ten passages, including Romans 3.28, you would, you would not agree with his interpretation, correct? Uh, assuming that he's advancing the Protestant interpretation, I would yeah, not the agree. Yeah, the Protestant interpretation. Okay. Now, how would you know that he was not correct? Okay, so that's your question. Yes. We would know that he's not correct based on whether it conflicts with the past teaching of the magisterium, which is the proximate rule of faith, okay, or the clear and universal teaching of the tradition of the church handed down through the ages, which is known as the ordinary and universal teaching of the magisterium. For instance, the church has always forbidden Catholics to pray and take part in non-Catholic worship. That's been taught throughout history. That's why Pope Pius XI says in Mortalium Animos, the apostolic see has always forbidden its subjects to take part in the assemblies of non-Catholics. That's the universal teaching of the church, okay? And, the, and also, it's, it was considered a mortal sin before Vatican II and throughout the whole history of the church if you actively participated in non-Catholic ceremonies. Now, we have these antipopes teaching it, practicing it, giving scandal, encouraging people to commit mortal sin. And that's what the whole directory for the application and principles of norms of ecumenism promoted by John Paul II and approved by him in, in sin. It's all about praying in communication with non-Catholic worship. So I would know that Martin Luther's wrong if he contradicts the magisterial teaching of the church, okay, or the universal tradition of the church. That, that's how you would know. That, that's it. Okay, the two-minute rebuttal now? Okay, yeah. I think that, that, that's part of my whole point here, is, is that when you had the heresy of Lutheranism or Arianism, one of the ways that you, there were great debates uh, for instance, in Arianism, uh, 
the, the Council of Nicaea uh, settled part of the matter when they came up with the Nicene Creed and declared that Jesus was one with the Father, God. Uh, here you have a situation where the Diamond Brothers take these quotes, attribute them heresy to these to these popes, and by their very own conclusions start a uh, start a movement that's been unprecedented in the church, and they have no way to tell us when we're going to have another pope. Uh, they cite the Great Western Schism earlier, and but the, the big difference is is that there there were uh, there were still there were still the method to get the pope was still in place. In this case, you don't have that. You do not, you simply do not have the method to get the Pope elected. And they still have not answered that question. I still go back to that question I, because it's the very foundation of everything they're saying. They're saying that these interpretations of these documents or of these writings of the five different Popes, that draws their conclusion. Well, if they, if we can't elect another pope, and we can't know when the other pope, another pope is elected, then their conclusion simply cannot be true. It's, it just simply cannot be true. Okay, that's, that's all I have. All right, now the second question from Brother Michael and Brother Peter Diamond. My question is, suppose you have a man who intends to become a Catholic. This convert, however, holds to the heresy of justification by faith alone, one you made reference to earlier. He holds that justification by faith alone is no longer condemned by the Council of Trent. Can that man be considered a true Catholic while holding that justification by faith alone is no longer condemned by the Council of Trent and that its canons no longer apply? Well, the way I read the documents uh, between uh, the Lutheran and Catholic documents uh, are they're not saying what you're saying. Uh, the Lutheran could not, the anathema is, uh, the condemnations may not apply, but the truth of Luther's erroneous teaching on justification, the fact that man is considered uh, legally justified and declared just, but on the inside is really not just, as Luther said, that is not acceptable Catholic teaching. And no, the Lutheran could not, could not follow that teaching. But as I, read, as I read the document, I haven't read it in about a year and a half, so I'm, I'm a little sketchy on that. Um, but you can use the term faith alone, but you cannot use it if you mean, mean it the way Luther meant it, the legal forensic act. As a matter of fact, I believe prior to the 16th century, there were Catholic priests uh, and even some saints who used the term faith alone, but they didn't mean it the way Luther meant it. Uh, if you mean it to mean that good works flow out of it, you use the word faith alone, because if you have faith, that faith is going to produce works, then that would be acceptable. If you use it to say that man is forensically, legally just and doesn't need to do any works because God declares him just, and then, but he's not really sanctified, then no, he could not hold that view. And, I, and again, uh, you guys take one quote, and you draw a conclusion that this is heresy, and that, that's the basis for your entire argument. Your entire argument is one quote or, or a paragraph, and you interpret it, and it's heresy. Okay. Um, I will note that he didn't answer the question, which was that can a man be considered a Catholic? if he holds that justification by faith alone is not condemned by the Council of Trent. He didn't answer the question at all. The reason he didn't answer the question is because if he answers that he is considered a Catholic, that's a denial of the Council of Trent. If he answers that he's not considered a Catholic, he has to admit that John Paul II and Benedict XVI cannot be considered Catholics and therefore popes because, of course, in 1999, they agreed with the Lutherans on the doctrine of justification, something I've studied in depth, and he says... This is the Joint Declaration number 13. In light of this consensus, the corresponding doctrinal condemnations of the 16th century, that means the Council of Trent, do not apply to today's partner. That means the Lutherans are not condemned for rejecting Trent. It goes on to say that the teaching of the Lutheran Church, this is number 41 of the 
joint declaration. The teaching of the Lutheran Church is presented in this declaration does not fall under the condemnations from the Council of Trent. Well, in this uh, joint declaration, it teaches justification by faith alone, okay, in number 26, according to Lutheran understanding, God justifies sinners in faith alone. So, uh, explicitly stating the Protestant view of faith alone, saying that's not condemned by Trent. Okay, it asserts other ridiculous Lutheran heresies, such as human beings are incapable of cooperating in their salvation, number 21. That's not heresy, according to Benedict XVI and John Paul II, and on and on. It, it sets forth the whole Lutheran uh, program of heresy. And just so you know, here's what Benedict XVI, they both approved it, and John Paul II says, refers to the signing of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Benedict XVI refers to the important Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. And the official Vatican newspaper talks about how the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification was signed by the Catholic Church. That's the false Vatican II Church, which officially agrees with the Protestants on justification. Not the Catholic Church, which holds to the Council of Trent, which anathematizes Protestant teaching. And also the Council of Trent, which says if you do not... Time has expired. Okay. Um, now the third question from Mr. Goley. Okay. For me, am I asked a question? Yes, your, yes, your third okay. question. Okay, third question. Uh, I did answer the question. I said no, he couldn't if he held to Luther's view, but he could use the word faith alone. Okay, here's my question. Uh, why? You have, you've had 50, almost 50 years now. You have no cardinals. You have no hierarchy. Why don't you study the concept, get together, get the Roman clergy or whoever, whoever else you believe can elect another pope and elect them? Because, as we've pointed out throughout this debate, the tradition of the church in the first millennium is that the clergy has the prerogative to elect the, the Pope of Rome, okay? Not the clergy of some other locality. That's the reason. And, and you keep emphasizing that there's no mechanism. The laws of the papal conclave are ecclesiastical laws. That's why they've been changed, okay? And there's a principle in canon law called the intrinsic cessation of law, referring to disciplinary laws, that when they become um, harmful to the church, or when those laws have passed out of use, usefulness, okay, they cease to apply in that particular situation. That applies to ecclesiastical law. That's why it's a law that you cannot consecrate a bishop without a papal mandate. But in a certain necessity, when it needs to be done, you can do it, okay? And also, one other thing is that Pope Paul IV, when he's talking about how a Catholic cannot accept a heretic as pope, he doesn't sit, go on and say, and therefore people should get together and elect a pope. And that they're just acknowledging the fact that this guy who claims to be Pope is a heretic. It doesn't state what you're supposed to do after that point in time. It's just that you're to acknowledge the clear-cut fact, which we can see, that this guy is a manifest heretic and therefore not Pope, period. And against a fact, there is no argument, okay? People can raise all kinds of points about how distressing that might seem. But against a fact, there's no argument. It's a fact that heretic cannot be the Pope, and it's a fact that the Vatican II antipopes are heretics. That's it for, for that answer. All right, two-minute rebuttal. Uh, yeah, basically the Diamond Brothers admit they don't know. They simply don't know. And I think unless they can answer that question, they cannot win this debate. They don't know. I asked them a very specific question. Why hasn't the Roman clergy gotten together after 50, almost 50 years and elected another pope? Think about the craziness of their position here. They have asserted, contrary to what they may have said earlier, that if somebody doesn't accept their Seti Vacantis position and their, no sal their interpretation of no salvation outside the church, they're not a Catholic. They're a heretic. They're the first ones to call someone a heretic. So think about the absurdity. They're going to have to find the clergy of Rome that has to be Seti Vacantis, they have to accept everything that they, that, that, that their interpretation, and then they would have to get together and elect the Pope. Think about that. I don't even know if there's anyone in Rome that would hold to that position. I seriously doubt it. And even then, we have a question of whether even that would be valid, because we wouldn't know. It's never happened. We simply, we simply don't know. And... That's what they're asking you to believe. They're saying, hey, this has never happened in history. We're quoting all these passages which, because, you know, we have 47 years to do this. We're quoting all these passages, accept our interpretation, 
and this has never happened in, in history, and these guys are heretics, and we don't know how you're going to get